Are there any questions about the homework assignment? No. Yep. Um, I sent you an email last night. I don't know if you got it, but um, the link there for the HTML editor mm -hmm. was replaced with iCalendar. I don't know. It's very strange. Okay, I did get your message. I replied as well. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And basically, I could not reproduce the problem because I can switch my role to a student role, just like what I'm doing here on the whiteboard. And if I go to the homework assignment, this is what I see. So you're not even seeing this part here? No, I'm seeing that part again. You are not, or you are? I, I am seeing edit my submission, yeah. Okay, so when you click edit my submission, it will turn into an HTML editor. Okay, maybe I just need a different computer or something. I think you need to look into your browser. Wh which browser were you using? Safari, I think. Okay, try Firefox. Yeah. Okay, yep. I was using Google Chrome and it would only do the first line, but then I went to Firefox. Yeah. And it did everything. So that yeah. Be because if you use anything that is not like IE7 or before or Firefox, what happens is, you know, the, the Moodle automatically recognizes that it is a browser that does not support the JavaScript that it needs in order to give you the HTML editor. So as a result, if you use anything other than uh, Internet Explorer or Firefox, you won't see the HTML editor. Now, when you don't see the HTML editor, then every time you have a every time you have a less than symbol, it will be interpret interpreted as the beginning of a tag in HTML, and that's why the rest of the line disappeared. Because as soon as you enter like you know less than something, it will be interpreted as the open of an HTML tag. And which means, you know, if you don't have a matching end, then the rest of the document is lost. Okay, is that making any sense? Yeah. Yep. So that that means, you know, when you deal with an HTML editor like this, just to be sure, it is usually best to use Notepad or some kind of some some kind of text editor to edit your answer first, save it as a file, and then just copy and paste it into Moodle. If Moodle does not take it the first time. Nothing is lost because you have a file already saved. Okay. Yep. Um, I tried opening some of the files the other day and, and into I think Notepad and it would make it all one line. Yes, you have to use WordPad you for that. Use Word WordPad. WordPad. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I use WordPad to see if it changes the way I set it up the WordPad that I tested. Changes the setup that I had in WordPad mm -hmm. in a different way when I paste it over there. Hmm. It changed the default settings? No, it changed the way I wanted to present to you. Mm -hmm. when I, uh, I think the yeah, the leading spaces will be deleted. Are you referring to like leading spaces? It was just going all over. Just going all over? <laughs> so Do you guys want to turn it into like you know, turning a file instead? I mean, I can turn it back into it, you know, submit a file type. Yeah, file would be easier. I don't know. Okay. So, okay, where? What are you copying from? From WordPad. From WordPad. Yes. For the homework, right? Yes. Try Notepad instead of WordPad because WordPad supports some kind of you know editing and formatting, and the HTML editor may not be able to handle what WordPad can deal with. Generally speaking, when you're importing anything from Microsoft product into Moodle, it doesn't work very well. It can import very well from open office products for some reason. Including spreadsheets. Okay, if you if you try to select like a bunch of cells in a spreadsheet in open office calc, select it, copy and then paste it into Moodle, you know, using the HTML editor, it will preserve everything, including the width of the columns, which is which is great. But if you try to do the same thing in uh, Microsoft Office, Excel, it doesn't work. You know, everything is like all over the place. So it has to do with you know, how Microsoft products encode, you know, HT, uh, encode tables and text internally. And for some reason, they use some method that is overly complicated. So let's go ahead and get started again. You know, I remember what we stopped last time. So what I'll do is I'll go back to the file from last Thursday, and then we'll talk about the pre and post condition of that one multi-branch conditional statement.
that has at least one dead branch because we want to see what the dead branch will look like in pre and post conditions. So that's the uh, that's how that's where we start you know in this class. Then we will go from there you know into loops because loops are definitely nasty. Okay, this is my text editor, so everything shows up just fine. But this is the program that we were looking at the other day. And I want to show you guys, you know, what a dead branch will look like in the case of, you know, pre and post conditions. So I will do a copy first, and then I'll use my own um, editor for today, so everything will be saved as a text file. Go. Nope. Just in case I forget, I'm saving the file first as text.txt. And to make it easier on you guys, you know, I, I just found this option here. I did not realize there was an option down here. I can save it into the Windows compatible line ending. So this time you can open it with Notepad and it won't, you know, appear as one single huge long line. Okay. So tell me whether it works or not. Okay. I think it works a little bit. Okay. So here we have, you know, a sample program that is a multi-branch conditional statement. It's multi-branch because we have one state, one condition and two conditions <coughs> here. And then we also have the else over here. The question is, how do we specify the pre and post conditions of the items inside the conditional statement as well as what is the post condition of everything? Before we start on this one, let me do something that I usually forget. This is the row sheet for today. <coughs> Okay, so in this case, you know, I would say pre one equals true. Can anyone remind me what is the actual meaning when I say pre the precondition of line one is true? Mm, well, that's what it's spelling out. But what what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it say anything about variable x? No. No. Does it say anything about variable z? No. So when the precondition is true, it simply means we don't know anything about the variables at all. Okay? That's basically what it is. It's equivalent of a trace where the variables start with a question mark, unknown values. But in this case, it's fine because we are not tracing this code. We are trying to work out the pre and post conditions. So it is perfectly fine for us to specify your pre, the precondition is true, meaning we know nothing about the variables. What do you think is the precondition of line two? In other words, if I know that I am about to execute line two, but not yet, what can I know at that point? That is true. Okay, first of all, pre one is still true because I did not, I have not had a chance to modify any of the variables. So that's why pre one is still true. And on top of that, I also know that x is greater than 5. Because if x is not greater than 5, I would not have picked that red branch. Is that making any sense? It's all good? Okay. So the next step is just to expand what is pre-1. Pre-1 is given to me. It is just true. And x is greater than 5 is x is greater than 5. And this one simplifies to x is just greater than 5. I think we have already talked about why we can do this simplification. Because true is the identity with respect to conjunction in Boolean logic. Okay, so that's easy. How about pre three? Excuse me, pre four. No, but this time we have to think carefully because if you think about the logic of a multi-branch conditional statement, when do we even start? When do we even go to line three? Okay, line one has to be false. The condition on line one has to be false to go to line three. Okay, so this time we know that pre one is still true because we have not had a chance to change any um, variables at this point. But we know one thing, x is greater than five has to be false. Because x is greater than five, if that was true, then we would have executed line two already. The fact that we are about to execute line 4 means that x is greater than 5 has to be false. But yet, x is greater than 10 has to be true. 
are we convinced that this is the precondition of line four? For those of you who are not 100% convinced, I'll just draw a picture really quickly. Okay, this is a multi-branch conditional statement. The first branch is based on the answer of is x greater than five? If it is true, we go to line two. If it is not true, we go to the false branch, which asks the second question. Is x greater than 10? If it is true, it will go to the line four. In this case, if it is false, it will go to the else case. Are we doing okay so far? We are asking about this condition here. What do we know if we are here? Well, how do we get here? Well, we have to get here from going here, make this, make this turn. How do we make this turn here? X is greater than five, has to be false. Are we doing okay? Then we have to like, take another turn here. When we make this turn, it means X is greater than 10, has to be true. And on top of everything else, whatever was true before this entire statement, which is our pre one, still has to be true because we have not had a chance to change a variable yet. So that's why in the pre and post condition form, we say pre one has to be true, X is greater than five has to be false, and X is greater than 10 has to be true. But this does not really work out very well, does it? Because the first one is just true, which is not difficult. The second one is saying x is less than or equal to five, because when you say it is not the case that x is greater than five, it is the same as saying x is less than or equal to five. And the last one is x is greater than 10. Well, we can always take out the true and part out of the whole equation, so now it becomes just x is less than or equal to five, and x is greater than 10. Why is this a problem? Is it possible? You cannot find a single value x that can satisfy both of these comparisons at the same time. x cannot be less than or equal to 5 and greater than 10 at the same time. Is everybody convinced that these two comparisons cannot be true at the same time? Now, if these cannot be true at the same time, regardless of the value of x, then the entire thing becomes false. This is the signature of a dead branch. In other words, when we, when we see a precondition of a line, in this case, line four is false, that means line four itself is a dead branch. If it is already a dead branch, it doesn't make any sense to go any further because you know the precondition of the entire line is false to begin with, it cannot become true anymore. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. But we still have another one to take care of. We have to take care of pre-6. Now pre-6 is not a dead branch. Even though you know pre-4, I mean line 4 is a dead branch, line 6 is not a dead branch. The, way, the, the reason why it's not a dead branch is because it is pre-1 has to be true, x is greater than 5 has to be false, and x is greater than 10 also has to be false for us to get there. Is that making any sense? Because if you look at this picture here, this is our pre-6 here. In other words, we are, know, we are asking what do we know at this point before the assignment statement? Well, how do we get here? We have to make this turn here, which means x is greater than 5 is false. We also have to take this turn here, which means x is greater than 10 also has to be false. So we have to make this false, x is greater than 5, make this false, x is greater than 10 to end up here. Well, can that be true? Well, let's go ahead and find out. Pre-1 is true. Not x is greater than 5, it's just, it's just x is less than or equal to 5. Not x is greater than 10, it's just x is less than or equal to 10. We can simplify the true and out of the whole thing. First thing we can get rid is true and something. Um, is that possible? Can I find an x such that it is less than or equal to 5 and x less than or equal to 10 at the same time? Yeah. Yes. Can I simplify the conjunction? Yes. Which term can I toss? x is less than or equal to 10. Exactly. Now why is that the case? How come I can simplify this whole thing to just x is less than or equal to 5? Because it's less than 5, it's also less than 10. Yep. How many people learned set theories in high school or in some other classes? 
No one? One, two. Okay, that stuff comes in very handy in a class like this. How about the number line? How many people learn how many people learned or remember the number line from I don't know, fourth grade? Okay? Let's take a look at the number line. I know it makes sense, you know, but we need to know why it makes sense because sometimes it is not as you know, easily understood. Okay, this is the number line. Zero, one, two, three, four. Not to scale. And then we have ten here. Okay? So when we specify x can be less than or equal to five, that means you know x can be from here and all the way to the other side. When we specify that x can be less than or equal to 10, we are saying that it can include 10 itself and everything to this side. When we look at conjunction, are we looking at the overlapped portion or are we looking at the overall, you know, just one of these lines has to cover that range? Conjunction means overlapped, okay? So when you look, look at the overlapped portion of these two lines, they both start from here and go you know, all the way to the left hand side. So that means you know we can simplify it just by saying you know x is less than or equal to five. But it is also true if you want to look at it the other way. In order for x to be less than or equal to ten, it first has to be less than. No, I take it back. If x is less than or equal to five, it is automatically less than or equal to ten. So that makes the second condition not very useful in a conjunction. Is that okay so far? No. Okay. X is less than or equal to five implies X is less than or equal to ten. And that's why we can simplify the conjunction. The rest of this is pretty easy. The rest of it, you know, is just you know applying the forget rule, you know, three uh, twice. The first time is a, is to apply the forget rule on line two. So when you talk about line two, you can say the right hand side of line two does not refer to the left hand side. Use the forget rule. This part is somewhat related to your homework assignment. I'll just say it somewhat. <clears throat> so now what do you do? You say the post condition of line two is based on the pre condition of line two, but we have to forget everything that we knew about Z because we are changing Z. But after the assignment, according to this, Z will get a value of one. So that's how we set up the forget rule. And then after that, you just expand what is pre two. Pre two, is just x is greater than 5. We want to forget all the components that mention anything about z, and after this line, we know z is 1. Does x is greater than 5 mention anything about z? Nope. nope. So there's nothing to forget in this case. x is greater than 5 is the result of the forget operation. And on top of that, we also know that z equals to 1. So that's what post 2 is. Are there any questions about this? Questions? What about post four? Very similar stuff. Okay, post four. Now, post four, pre four is false to begin with. Okay, but that's okay. We can still blindly apply these operations because it will still turn out exactly the same way. Okay, so you can always say the right hand side of line four does not refer to the left hand side, use the forget rule. Obviously I'm doing something that is not really necessary because if the precondition is false, that means we don't really have to track it down anyway. But if I do track it down, I want to show you that it does not really hurt. Because, okay, what is pre four? Pre four is false to begin with. Does false refer to Z? Nope. So it just becomes false and z equals 2. And how can I simplify this? It's just false because false and anything is false. 
So it still works out okay, even though it is a unnecessary step. Okay, so we have line six to deal with. Okay, the right hand side at this point. When you do your homework assignment, you should do the same thing. You know, whenever you can copy and paste, you know, just copy and paste. That will save you a lot of time. The right hand side of line six does not refer to the left hand side. Use the forget rule. And you can even use the basic setup. Just remember to change the line numbers. And also the, the value of Z after the operation. And then we can just expand this. What is pre six? Pre six is just this part here. And after you forget, there's nothing to forget because X is less than or equal to five, does not refer to Z at all. So there's nothing to forget. The, the result of forgetting is the same as before we forget anything. That's the result. Now we have the individual components. <coughs> now remember, in a multi-branch conditional statement, all the branches, they all have to merge at the very end before we get to post seven. So when you need to look at post seven and say, what exactly do we know after the conditional statement execute, then it becomes a disjunction of all the branches. The post condition of every branch will be, the, will be in the disjunction. In this case, it will be post two or post four or post six. So I am taking the dead branch into consideration because it really does it really does not hurt. We know post four is just false. Post two is this expression here. And then post six is this expression here. And that's my final answer. Well, I can simplify that a little bit. How can I simplify this? We can get rid of the dead branch because anything or false is just that anything. In other words, when you have conjunction, true is the identity for conjunction. When you have disjunction or the, the value false is the identity. It's kind of like zero. False is like zero in addition because zero plus anything is anything. And in this case, false or anything is anything as well. So we can simplify this just a little bit. We can take the false out of the whole thing. And that becomes the final answer. Are there any questions about this particular case, the multi-branch conditional statement that has a dead branch? No questions? If there are no questions, we'll move on. And this, yep, go ahead. Can you go on six wing with the rest of the year? You want to go up? Last two lines, go. You want to scroll up? This? Um, no. Okay. But it's all being saved anyway, so this is all going to be uploaded later on in the class, at the end of the class. Because after this, we'll talk about loops, and loops are definitely evil. <laughs> the fact that you can go back to an earlier step makes it very hard to deal with. So we'll, I'll show you guys why it is difficult to deal with, because it goes back to an earlier step. So once again, don't worry about copying what I have on the board, because I have saved it already. So someone just has to remind me to upload the file and it will be online after the class. <clears throat> how many of you how many of you have learned the differences of if, only if and if and only if? Okay, where do you learn that? Is it a philosophy class? Um, it's kind of a math and philosophy class to here symbolic logic. Okay. The rest of the class? No. <laughs> You have not. Okay. Now that stuff is kind of important because you know sometimes you can see that I use you know only if sometimes I use if and sometimes I use if and only if they are three different things. Okay. Well, when we get to the point, you know, I can explain the differences between those three you know cases because they are all different. 
but at this point, we'll just kind of move on and talk about loops. So let's go back to my notes. Move back to pre and post conditions. This is a topic that we were on. And now we are at the last topic. Okay. So what we have here is a fairly fairly simple loop. You know, one lines one, two, three, four. And I don't even have a picture of that, but I do have the full description of what is going on here. And this is the part where you might want to write down to what I have on the board because I'm going to draw a picture. And the picture is going to be useful. I can't draw a picture using you know, software as quickly or as effectively as I can do it on the whiteboard, and that's why I don't do it, you know, with the computer in this case. Let's draw a picture that represents, you know, this loop here. <coughs> X gets zero is easy, okay? So let's make it so that it's not X gets zero, okay? Let's make it so that it's, it's X gets a value K instead of zero. And then we have the pre-checking loop. A pre-checking loop has a way to get back into the loop first before you can branch because we have to make a decision after you, know, you merge from this path and the loop back here. The question of branching, I'm changing it a, loop, a loop here. So instead of making it a constant three, let's make it an unknown, another variable that we call v here. So I'm changing a little bit from the example in the notes but I'm preserving pretty much of the logic is you know, just the same. This is the true branch. If it is true, we perform a simple operation. <coughs> x gets x plus one. So I'm preserving that part to be the same. If it is false, then we get out of the loop. Okay, not a very nice picture, but still works. Okay. Do we have any questions about the picture itself? questions. Now we have to be very clear that these are one-way streets. We can come in through these two ways. We can get out through these two ways. And we, the way we choose which way to go depends on the answer to the question. Is x less than v? Yep. Okay. The answer my question. Okay. Now this picture becomes very useful because when we talk of the pre and post conditions, you know, now it becomes fairly you know, important. Any questions about this? Now, the precondition of the entire loop is fairly easy to understand. We can just say that, you know, in this case, it is pre two because line two is the before is the loop. So before we get into the loop, we know one thing: x equals k. Does that make sense? Because the the statement right before the loop is x gets the value of k. That's not difficult. That's not that's not too bad. And we'll just you know give this condition here a name. Um, we'll call it post three. In other words, this is the post post condition of line three in the code. Does it make sense to call it post three? Because line three is x gets x plus one, so this makes sense to be post three. So now let me ask you a question. What is this condition here? In other words, how do I express pre-3? Okay, let's take a look. How do we express pre-3? How many ways do we have to get to post, to get to pre-3? Well, first of all, we know one thing. If we are going to execute line three, we know this condition has to be true. Is that right? <coughs> the precondition of the entire loop, the condition of this loop here, x is less than, in this case, v, has to be true. Because otherwise, there's no way I will get end up on line three. Is that making any sense? Okay. So that means pre-3, I can start it out as x has to be less than v. And, well, there's a bunch of stuff that we have to think about. First of all, 
one way to get from here to get to this point here, which is pre three, is x equals k. Is that making any sense? So one way to say is x equals to k exactly, because you know it's I come in here. This is my first iteration. I did not come back from the loop itself. But the second way to get here is to get through here and then come back here. So in that case, what do I, you know, or this condition with? Post three, right? So we have post three here being true all the way around here. It comes back here and it turns out that x is still less than b. We get into this branch here and so at this point, post three is also true. So let's just look at this equation here and make sure we understand what it means. Does that make sense? Okay, yep, go ahead. I, I, it makes sense, it's just hard to comprehend that you can have a post three before a pre three. Yep, mm hmm. Well, we have a chicken and egg problem, don't we? <laughs> in order to compute post three, we need to know what is pre three. Unfortunately, pre three also has a component that ha that is post three itself. So that makes this a little bit difficult. Hmm. But we'll just kind of let it sit for a while. We'll come back and talk about it later. Let's go ahead and talk about the post condition of the entire loop. In other words, we are talking about post four in this case. What can we say about post four? Well, let's see. Post four is what? What about this condition here? X is less than B. That has to be false. has to be false. Okay, so we can say it is not the case that X is less than B. I'm using the math symbol here because it's just easy to write. Okay. On top of that, what else do we know? what else do we know? This is and. Is it possible that we skip the loop altogether and just you know go from x equals k and go all the way out? Yes. Yeah. It is possible because it depends on what v is, how v relates to k. So in one case, you know, we can say, oh, x equals to k, and we get out of the loop immediately. How about the other case? If x equals k does not get out of the loop immediately, that means we have to go, get into here. That means we can go through at least one iteration. At some point the lock in the last iteration, we get back from the loop and we get to this junction here and this turns out to be false and then we got out. But guess what? In that case, post three would also be true. Okay? So post three is also here. So it seems like post three is the pivot point of everything because it is in almost every single important point of the loop itself. So how do we call something like post three here? It is always there. It is called a loop invariant. Okay, it's called a loop invariant because this condition does not change. When you're in the loop, post three has to be true. When even when you get out of the loop, post three is also true unless you, we can as we can get out without one single iteration, but if you go through at least one iteration, post three, post three will be true. Okay. Are there any questions about how things are set up at this point? We know it is. It seems really difficult to solve for post three, but at least you know does everything on the board at this point make sense? Sort of, kind of. Okay. So let's just say that it makes sense, okay? <laughs> let's just say it makes sense. The question now is, how do we know what exactly is post three? What, what if I tell you I have a suspicion what post three is? Can, do you think we can plug it in and you know, try it out to see if it works out? Sure, we can do that. So for this part, I'm going to copy everything onto the notepad again. <coughs> just so that we can capture at least you know, this, all the equations. So we'll just capture everything like 3, 2 is x equals k, 3, 3. Can you, can you copy the um, thing that we're referencing to the document? Sure. Um, x got 
get 3 to x gets k. Change x is less than 3. Oops. Uh, that's 0. To x is less than 3. How's that? The first one is the URL to the web page that we're referring to. The second part you know, states what I did, what I changed in the HTML you know, so to get to the current point. Okay, so pre-3 is going to be what? Pre-3 is x is less than b for sure, and x equals k or post-3. And then we have post-3 itself by on its own. We don't know what it is. And then we have post-4. Post 4 is, it is not the case that x is less than b because otherwise we would not be getting out of the loop. And x equals k or post 3. I don't need the extra pair of parentheses here, so we can just get rid of that. It's really easy to read. Okay. Are we doing okay so far? Now, what if I tell you that I have a suspicion that post 3 is a particular condition. Okay, so here I, I let me let me make it very clear. Okay, I suspect, okay, make it very clear, suspect that post 3 is x is less than or equal to b. Okay? Now don't ask me why. It is just inspiration. Okay, I wake up one day and I say, oh, I have this suspicion. Maybe post 3 is as simple as x is less than or equal to b. The question now is, do you think I can prove that this is this will fit the, the system of equations? That's the question. Okay. Well, we don't know how Tag suspects this, but at least <coughs> we can prove whether tag is right or not. Okay? Now how can we prove whether I'm right or not? Can we just plug it in? Okay? Now what do I my, what do I mean by plug in? Let's put a quote plug in tax suspicion and see if everything works out. Okay. So the first thing I will plug it in is to plug it in, plug it in into pre three. Okay. So after you plug it in, that pre three will still have x is less than b, and then the second part is x equals k or post three. But what is post three again? My suspicion is that post three is x is less than or equal to b. Is that right? Okay. Uh, can I simplify that a little bit? Can I simplify this you know, whole thing a little bit here? Well, you can remove the x is less than b because it's covered by x is less than or equal to b. Mm, we can do something like that, you know, but I want to you know, see if you guys know how to manipulate it. Okay, if I give you, yep, go ahead. Well, you just change it so that x could equal b. Okay, does, it, does this look like something that you have seen usually in arithmetic? In other words, what if I give you x, oh, let's not use x, a times b plus c. That equals to what? ab times ac. How do we call this in normal arithmetic? It's, it's the distributive property. And we can, guess what? We can do the same thing with Boolean logic. Okay, the end is kind of like a multiplication the or is kind of like an addition. So we can actually use exactly the same thing. We can say this is the whole, this is the same as x is less than b and x equals k, the whole thing, or x is less than b and x is less than or equal to b. We can actually do the whole thing just like that. Oh, actually I have to go back and change this.
So using the distributive law, we can say x is less than b and x equals k, or x is less than b and x is less than or equal to b. Um, what happens to the first one? Let's just say that we can't really do anything about it. We'll just leave it the way it is. Can we do something about the second one? Oh, I forgot this is the end. Can we do something about this part here? <coughs> They're inclusive, so you can shorten it to x is less than or equal to b. Exactly. So in this case, we have to use x is less than or equal to b and not x is less than b because that's the more inclusive one. So now we simplify this whole thing to x is less than b and x equals k. So we'll just say that we cannot simplify that one. But this one we can simplify to x is less than or equal to b. Well, once we know pre-3, do you think we can derive post-3? Sure we can. The right-hand side of line 3 refers to the left-hand side. And the right-hand side is reversible. Because x plus 1 can be reversed by x minus 1. So that means if, if x, f of x is x plus 1, then the inverse of that is x minus 1. We can apply the substitution rule. When we apply the substitution rule, then post 3 is based on the substitution of pre 3. We replace all occurrences of x in this case, because x is the variable on the left hand side, by the inverse function f prime applied to f, applied to x. Well, what does that become? We take this whole thing, substitution, we take this entire thing, put it here, and then we specify we replace all x with x minus 1. Is that okay so far? So all, every step right now is just completely mechanical. I just want to see if I can get back to post 3. Okay. So when you do the substitution, we replace all the x's. And the substitution will go like this. x minus 1 is less than b, and x minus 1 equals k, and x minus 1 is less than or equal to b. Okay. Is that working so far? I think I made a mistake here. There's one more parenthesis that I need. One more pair. Things are not looking very good. Okay? Now, why is it not looking very good? What, what is the problem here? Some of you have read the notes already, so you know, you know how it's supposed to go. The problem has to do with this x equals k here. Okay? Now, tell me why, you know, tell me when, you know, this becomes a, becomes a problem. When do you think x is less than b and x equals k? cannot be true at the same time. When k is equal to... When x does not equal to k anymore, right? And this is because of a mistake that I made <coughs> earlier. Can anyone tell why I, why I said so? This is uh, based on pre-3. What mistake did I make? Let's go back bit here. Okay, this is pre-3, this is a or. And when we 
expand it, it becomes like this. I should have done the simplification here, but I did not. Can I simplify this? Can I simplify x equals k or x is less than or equal to b? Well, let's think about it. If k is greater than b, what happens? That becomes false. It cannot be true at the same time. But if if k is greater than b, do I even have to bother with this step here? Because I would have gone through the bypass and end up here anyway. So that means if I have to get in here, k has to be less than b to begin with. If I know that k is less than b, then what happens to that statement? Well, if you know that k is less than b, then you don't need it because it's included with the next step that's less right. or equal to b. Exactly. And we know that because you know we cannot get in here unless x is less than b. So if x equals to k, so, so that means that k itself has to be less than b at this point. So that means I can simplify this whole thing to x is less than b and x is less than or equal to b. Okay, let, me, let me just erase the rest of it so I can start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. Is that, is that okay? Is, is this step doing okay? I just you know, got rid of x equals to k because you know, this has to be inclusive x is less than or equal to v has to include the case where x equals to k. Okay? Because otherwise I won't be in the loop. I will be out of the loop already. Can anyone go at least get to this part? Yes? I know. If you look at the picture, we are at this point here. When I'm at this point, doesn't it imply that x is less than b? Now, x can also be equal to k at the same time, but in that case, it has to imply that k has to be less than b as well, because otherwise, I would not be here. I'm just wondering why is it less than or equal to b? Because that's my suspicion. Oh, that was this, okay. Because that's my suspicion. I suspect that pos 3 is x is less than or equal to b, so I just plug that into where, you know, wherever post 3 was. Okay. Okay. So let me just explain <coughs> this stuff here. We can simplify, simplify, because if we are in the loop, k has to be less than b. Um, can we simplify a little bit more when I say x is less than b and x is less than or equal to b? Yeah, just which which, which term do I, do I remove? Second. The second one. That's right. We can just go for the more respective one and say x is less than b. Now this make it this makes it feel very easy because post okay I just have to go through the same motion as last time. The right hand side of line three refers to the left hand side. Okay, same thing as before, and it is reversible, same as last time. F of x is x plus one, which means the which means the inverse function is x minus one. We can use the substitution rule. When you use the substitution rule, post three equals to the substitution of three three we take all the x's and we place every single one with f prime of x, just like that. Is that okay? Yeah, this part has nothing to do with whether, whether line three is in a loop or not. Every time we see a, an assignment statement where the right-hand side refers to the left-hand side and the right-hand side is reversible, we can apply this. What is pre-three? Pre-three is just this one here. And we replace all the x's, which is, there's only one, with x minus 1, which is f prime of x. 
So this whole thing becomes x minus 1 is less than b. OK, so now we have a big, now we have a question, not as big as the previous one. We now have post 3 equal to x minus 1 is less than b. But my suspicion, if you looked up there, my suspicion is um, post 3 is x is less than or equal to b. In other words, can we change this to x is less than or equal to b? Okay, let me highlight here what I'm talking about here. Look at this condition here. Or we can, let me, let me make this change it just one more time. If I say x is less than b plus 1, is it the same as saying x is less than or equal to b? Yeah. But only when x is plus 1, an integer. Okay? So I can make this last step here and say x is less than b because x is an integer. It doesn't work when it's not an integer, but when it is an integer, it works. Okay, because this one is asking what is um, this one is saying you know x is an integer, and it has to be less than v plus one. This one is saying x is an integer, but it can be less than or equal to v. They mean exactly the same thing when x is integer, but when x is not an integer, they are not exactly the same thing. Are we doing okay so far with this? with this step here? So I have just proven that my suspicion worked out. Okay, you guys? That makes no sense. Like, that makes no sense? I don't know. How do you explain how you got to that? How you got to that step? Okay, this, you mean the last two steps? Yeah, the last two steps. This I, one here? I see, I see how, you, how you got there. I don't know how you got to the last step, though. Okay, okay. so how do we go from here to here? Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, I can give you some you know, specific value. So in other words, let's say you know, b is 4. Okay, okay let's just you know, use an example. b is 4. What is the largest integer that is less than 4? 4 plus 1, sorry. The largest integer that's less than 4 plus 1? Yeah. It'll be 4. What is the largest integer that is less than or equal to 4? The largest four. integer that's less than or equal to 4? Yeah. 4. It'll be 4. Okay. Okay? Okay, I got that. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a property of integers you know, that just you know, kind of works out in this case. But if, if x is not an integer, then it does not work out. You cannot you know, make that last jump anymore. Are we doing OK with this? Yeah, yeah. It, it, does it, yeah I know it, it doesn't make sense you know, intuitively. It, 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 it's easier when we have a solid value. Okay? So when we say you know, 5, you know, x is less than 5 versus x is less than or equal to 4, if you know that x is an integer, then those two expressions mean the same thing. So I'll just write it here too. Okay. So that means x is less than 5 is the same as x is less than or equal to 4, given that x is an integer. Because if I spell it out like this with with concrete values, you know, it's easier to accept, easier to see how they are equivalent. But if I don't, you know, and use, you know, the b plus 1 instead of b, then it becomes a little bit harder to just see that they are equivalent. Are we doing okay so far with this? Sort of? Okay. <clears throat> but what is our objective? Our objective is not to find what is post 3. Our final objective is to find out what is post 4, because we want to find out what is the post condition of the entire loop. So here, we can go to post 4. Okay. So let me just make a point here. At this point, we prove that tax suspicion worked out. Now, now that the suspicion worked out, we can use post 3 equals to x is less than or equal to v and plug it into post 4. So post 4 is here. So I'll just take that and paste it here. Now we can try to work out post 4. What was post 3 again? 
that, right? Okay. And now we have two cases, okay, depending on which. This is true, okay, this part is already done. In other words, we know, regardless of the value of B and the value of K, by the time we get to the, when we get to post four, this has to be true. The question is, oh, but wait, tech, what about the case when, you know, X, when K is, how oh, that work out anyway? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <clears throat> Okay, so now we have two cases. The first case, in case one, case one is what happens when, what happens if K is greater than B, greater than or equal to B. Well, let's see if we can do something about that. Post four is not X is less than B, and X equals K, or X is less than or equal to B. Um, okay, what can we do? Can, what, can we simplify something here? Can we do something about this? Knowing that K is greater than or equal to B. Yes, in this case, you can replace the X is less than or equal to B with X equals K. Okay. So we'll say not X is less than B and X equals K because we know k is greater than or equal to b. Because if <coughs> k is greater than b, we won't get into the loop at all. Okay. The negation of x is less than b becomes x is greater than or equal to b, and then we have x equals to k. Can we simplify this? Knowing that K is greater than or equal to B. Can we simplify anything here? Well, are we conflicting? <coughs> Do we have a conflict here? Does it become false? No. Okay, we know that K is already greater than or equal to B. That's a given. So if we know that K is greater than or equal to B, and we know X is equal to K, doesn't that make you know x is greater than or equal to b automatic? Yes. Okay. So which one is redundant? Is this one redundant or that one is redundant? Which one can I get rid of in order to preserve the meaning but make it simpler? X is greater than or equal to b. Mm, no, because in no, this case we have to find a more restrictive one. Yeah, you've already proved that k is greater than b, so that's all that's needed. So that's the more restrictive one, right? Okay, so case two, what happens if k is less than b, which is more common? This is the more common case. Okay, so we just spell out the whole thing again. Knowing that k is less than b, how can we simplify this equation? The first thing I will do is to change x is, it is not the case that x is less than b, I change that to x is greater than or equal to b. But to be more specific, what can we do about the second part here? If we just focus on this, knowing that k is less than b, what can we do about this? It is the more, it's the, it's the inclusive case in this case, right? Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, we know that x is less than b. So that's, that's given. We also know that x equals to k or x is less than or equal to b. How can we simplify? Well, we can simplify because we can get rid of this one here. Because knowing that k is less than b, if x equals to k, that means x is less than b. So this becomes x is less than b, this becomes x is less than or equal to b, which is already given here. But when you have a disjunction, you have to pick the one that is more inclusive. 
So that's why this whole thing will simplify to x is less than or equal to b. Is that making any sense? Now, can we simplify this? x is greater than or equal to b, and x is less than or equal to b. x has to be b. OK, so now we have two cases. In one case, if k is greater than or equal to b to begin with, then when, by the time we get out of the loop, x equals to k, which makes sense, because we won't even go through one single iteration. In the other case, if k is less than b, then x equals to b when we get out of the loop. Okay. Are there any questions about this one? Yep. I'm not sure how you got x is greater than or equal to b. You mean here? Yeah. It's coming from the negation of x is less than b. Oh, okay. So this part here, not x not x is less than b, I just <coughs> rewrote it as x is greater than or equal to b because they mean exactly the same thing. Okay. Any questions about loops, pre and post conditions of loops? Do we want any questions about loops in the test? I don't want to read any answers. Um, I did have one question. When we do, if we get to a point where we have to show a loop and what's happening with it, is there a way we should notate repeated going through the loop or just keep it as post three because it's now the post three the next time? Or is there a way we can show that this is the second iteration, third iteration? It should not matter. Okay. It should not matter because you know if, that's a good question. The question is, you know, can do we want to, you know, represent, you know, this is post three after the first iteration, it is post three after the second iteration, and so on. That's your question, right? Correct. Do we need to differentiate post three after a certain number of iterations? And the answer is no. Okay, the answer is we only have one post three. So if you have if you go through at least one iteration, that's our post three. It does not matter whether whether it's the first or the second, as long as you go through it at least once, it is post three. That's a good question. And you won't see any questions on loops when, we come, when it comes to pre and post conditions. Because what is, what is the pivotal point of this whole thing? Let me answer your question first. Go ahead. Oh, so I was wondering, is post three always the same? Because once you go through one iteration, all the conditions, the pre and post conditions, are still the same? Post three is the same. You know, If you go through at least one iteration, it just works out that way. Because if we have to go through here once, if we, if we have to execute x gets x plus 1 at least once, then post 3 becomes true already. That's the definition of post 3. It is whatever condition that has to be true after the execution of line 3. right? That's the very definition of post 3. But that condition gets carried all the way around here. So by the time you get to here, post 3 has to be true. If you choose to continue with another iteration, post three also has to be true here. If you choose to exit, guess what? Post three also has to be true here. So that's why post three is so important because by the time you get back to the beginning of the loop, regardless of which branch you take, post three still has to be true. Okay, so that makes that makes it very special. That's, that's why it's called the loop invariant, which basically means no matter how many times you go through the loop, no matter whether you're exiting or not, <coughs> post three still has to be true. The case when you can get out without a single iteration, that's actually just an exception case. Most loops will go through at least one iteration because you have to think about it. What is the value of a loop if you don't have to go through at least one iteration? It's not very useful, right? So most of the time you can assume a loop will have to go through at least one iteration. For that, for that particular reason. Okay. Any other questions about this? So once again, you know, you will not see any questions in, you know, your midterms um, regarding or the final exam regarding loops because it is just, you know, a little bit too complicated to deal with. What is the pivot? pivot uh, what is the pivotal or the magical step when we did all this stuff here? What is the most important step? What is the step that makes it the what what makes it difficult to deal with? Figuring out what is post three, right? Figuring you know, having the suspicion that x is less than or equal to b is post three, 
is the key to, to deal with all this stuff here. Because once we have that suspicion, we, can just, we just have to prove that it is the case. But coming up with the suspicion, let me just roll back to here. The difficult step is this part here. This is the, this is the step that is difficult. Because how do I come up with that suspicion? Well, it's just because I know it. But what if the loop is more complicated? Then it becomes more and more difficult to come up with the loop invariant condition. Okay? Now, having said that, most of the time, the loop invariant has to do with the condition itself. Okay? If you look at the condition of the loop, it usually has something to do with the loop invariant. Any questions at this point? I understand why pos three would be x is less than or equal to y is less than v because obviously that's the point that it's going to exit at. Mm -hmm. But why would it be equal to k? Yeah. Because what if k is okay? I can give you some some concrete you know values. What if k is five and v is two? If k is 5, that means you know x is 5 before we get to the loop. So by the time we get to the loop, we ask, you know, is 5 less than 2? The answer is no. And then we exit the loop without going through one single iteration. So in that case, x is k exactly because we don't even go through the loop once. Is that, is that explaining what you're asking or you're asking something else? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> because like, I think basically what, I was saying that I, I don't know. Your question is why can it equal to k, right? No, basically the your supposition was that um, x is less than or equal to v, correct? Was the that's was post, the post three three condition? Yeah. Now, but if you don't go through the loop at least once, that becomes irrelevant. Okay. Right. Because if you don't go through the loop even once, that means you know post three becomes not important because you're not you, you're not even getting through here. You're going here, okay. After the initialization, you get to this branch here, but at this branch, you choose to exit right away. So you don't even have one single iteration. But without a single iteration, post three is not even a part of the equation. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions about pre and post conditions? So in the test, you know, you will only see up to conditional statements, but loops will not be in the test. Now, I will ask you some questions, you know, in this form. Okay, so I will, I want to prepare you guys for the test just a little bit. Sometimes I will ask you to work backwards. Working backwards, you know, who wants to work backwards, right? <clears throat> so let's say we have line 23 here. Line 23 says you know, if k is, if x is greater than k, then on line 24, we say x gets x plus 1. On line 25, we say end it. Okay. So what if I tell you that post line 25 is, oh, let's say x equals to, okay, let's, let's start with some concrete value. Okay. What is pre-23? That's the question. How would you approach something like that? Okay, let, let us you know, take a look at this one again. Okay, I give you the post condition to begin with. Unlike the usual case where I give you the pre-condition and you have to derive the post condition. So in this case, if I know by the time we get out of line 25, x has a value of 16. What do I know before line 23, or immediately before line 23? What do I know about x? Can I say something about it? It's well, not always. <laughs> it's okay, so for a question like this, once again, it helps to have a picture, because you, know, you just have to walk the path backwards. What does this conditional statement look like? So this is once again something that is not in the notes. You know, I'm just using the whiteboard to explain it. 
We have a conditional statement. Every conditional statement, multi-branch or not, whether we have it else or not, will have two branches. It also has a condition. In this case, the condition is, is x greater than k? Okay? And on one side, we have something to perform. We have x gets x plus 1. What about the other side? Where we normally has else a statement, this time there's no there's nothing, there's no else. So what happens to this side here? There's just nothing to do, right? Well, if there's nothing to do, that's okay. That means you know if the condition is false, we just go straight you know out of the conditional statement instead of you know performing a particular action. So this is the picture of the conditional statement. Sorry? x is less than or equal to k, it will get to that branch. Okay. So what I'm telling you is, by the time we get to here, after they merge, I know that x equals to 16. Okay. The question is, what can I say about x at this point here? That's the question. What do you think? x is less than or equal to k. Well, let's see. We don't know which path we went through. Right? Because you know, we could have went through this path, we could have went through the other path. So what we need to do is to say, let's say we came from this branch here. So x equals to 16 becomes the post condition of the statement itself. Is that right? If I know that x equals to 16 after we add 1 to x, what is the value of x before we add 1 to it? 15. x equals to 15, right? What if we take, what if we are, this is the result of taking the false branch? If this is the result of taking the false branch, that means you know, right before we make the decision, <coughs> x equals to 16 already. Okay? So now, by the time we merge these two paths, x can be 15 or x can be 16. Now, but in order, for, in order for us to go through this branch, x equal to 16 has to be true, but at the same time, what else has to be false? x is greater than k has to be false. So you, can, you have to say x is less than or equal to k. In this case here, x equals to 15, but there's something else that I also know at this point. What else do we know? Right before we execute x gets x plus 1, X has to be greater than K. So when we merge these two paths up here, so if you look at just this bubble here, then it becomes a disjunction of those two. Is that making any sense? So this at this point here, it becomes a disjunction of ooh, X is greater than K and X equals 15. And then we have an or, because you know, it, we could have taken the other branch. The other side is x equals to 16, and x is less than or equal to k. Is that making any sense? I know it doesn't look like it makes any sense, because <laughs> but this is the equation. It works out to be this equation. Now, which part of it does not, does not make any sense? One of them cannot, is not possible. Okay. x is greater than k, and x equals to 15. Both of these conditions have to, have, they have to be true at the same time. Or x equals to 16 and x is less than or equal to k. Can you find me a k where it can be both of these can be true? Okay, let me repeat that question. Can you find can anyone find a value can okay this this particular thing works out. Okay, that's the way it is. The question is, can you find a k such that you know, both of these conditions can be true? Both conjunctions, you mean? 
both conjunctions, yes. You can't. You cannot because you know this one is saying you know, x is greater than k and yet x equals to 15, which means 15 is greater than k. Does it make sense in the first one? Okay, so this one here, if you just look at the top one, it implies that k equals to, k is less than 15. If you look at the bottom one, what does it mean? x equals to 16, x is greater than or equal to 16. So k cannot be less than 15 and greater than or equal to 16 at the same time. So that means regardless of which k you pick, one of these two branches will be a dead branch. For any particular value of k, okay, one of these two is going to be it's not a dead branch, dead branch, but it's just, you know, you cannot differentiate which way you came from anymore. <laughs> Is that okay or not? But why do we want to walk backwards when you're writing algorithms? In CISP 360, you won't be dealing with pre and post conditions. There won't be any homework assignments or any test questions that has pre and post conditions. So why do we want to spend the time to talk about how to walk backwards? Because sometimes you can get a result that you weren't looking for and you gotta find out why you got it. Okay, that's exactly right. Because when what happens when you when your program has a bug? It does not behave correctly, right? So at some point it's gonna crash or do something that it is not supposed to. It will become visible. Okay. So let let me just you know, use this side here to represent the execution of the program. So your program executes, executes. At some point, you know, you know that something is wrong at this point. Okay. So this is the first time when you know something is not good. Okay. Something is wrong with your program. Okay. But where is the problem? This is the first time that you realize there's a problem with the program. But where is the problem? Does the problem have to be like right here? No. It can be all the way up here. It can be all the way up here. It's just that it's not observable when the mistake was made. It was only observable at this point. So why do we want to be able to walk backwards? How, how do you debug a program when it is not behaving correctly down at this point here? You have to start tracing it backwards to find out where the where it could have you know, gotten, gotten to this point. So when you're able to deduct your program or deduce you know, all the conditions backwards, that gives you the ability to go back a little bit at least before you stop and say, okay, but I have no idea how I can get to this point. Because even with this technique here, at some point you, have, you will run into you know, a roadblock and say, okay, I have no idea how I can get to this point. So when you get into a roadblock like that, what you do is you put a breakpoint, you stop the program at that point, and then, or immediately before that point, so you can differentiate how you can get to that point. But when you debug a program, a lot of times, you have to start with a particular line of the program and say, I know something, I'm not supposed to be here, or the values of the variables are wrong already at this point. The question is, this line this by itself is not the problem. So where is the problem? It has to be lines before that. So being able to trace a program backwards will help you debug a program when you, know, you have to do something like this. Okay, what would be, okay, this is something that I have seen with UC Davis students when I was a teaching assistant back there. How do you think students debug a program when the homework assignment is due in, oh, let's say in eight hours, okay? It's, the, it's due in the morning at 8 a.m. Is midnight on that same day, okay? How do you, what do you think you know, students at UC Davis will debug programs given the pressure of you know, all that stuff? Do you think they do this? No, what do you think they do? Do they just rewrite it from the beginning? Um, that would be a good, that may not be a bad idea, okay? Given what I have seen <clears throat> with some students. I mean, some students usually get it done like a week before the due date. The worst that can happen is I see students making random changes to the programs. Now, not exactly random. I'm talking about changes like changing x is less than k to x is less than or equal to k. 
So they think you know it's a boundary case, or they change the order of operations, okay, just somewhat randomly, and hope that they will hit the right sequence. Why is that a bad idea? You make more problems. You can end up with more problems. Exactly. Okay. So the best way to do it is to start with where the program has gone wrong, and then try to go backwards, you know, one step at a time. When you can no longer you know, figure out, okay, how did I get here? Put a breakpoint there, or put a breakpoint like lines before that point, and then you can use, you know, the breakpoint or use the debugger to help you in that process. Okay, I know none of you or very few of you know what I'm talking about. What is a debugger? When you get to CISP 360, the first thing you ask your professor is, where is my debugger? Okay, because you know you have to learn how to use a debugger to debug a program and not only rely on print statements and stuff like that. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. And that's the end of, of today's lecture. And don't forget your homework assignment that's due on Thursday. Sorry? Is that on the schedule? I saw one, a test it's, on there. It's usually on week six. So the question is, is this week six already? Right?